Good morning. So welcome to the digital preservation track of our third day of open repositories, uh, or fourth day if you were doing workshops. I think these are the, uh, the crowd seems slightly thinner but more dedicated after last night's uh, shenanigans. Uh, so we know we've got, we're, we're bound to have a very good session. Uh, this is a two hour session, so uh, for all of the speakers, it is a full 30 minute time block. Um, and as before, we'll try to allow for about five minutes of questioning um, towards the end of the session. And uh, we will be, we are web streaming, so if you do have a question, please wait for the runner to bring the mic up to you. And then we'll, we have two panel sessions, so there'll be a little bit of microphone juggling up front as well. So uh, first up, we have a, a presentation on digital, the Digital Preservation Network, or DPEN, um, and saving the scholarly record together. And this will be uh, brought to you by Michelle Kimpton, uh, CEO of DuraSpace, and Robin Regaber of the University of Virginia. So Michelle and Robin, take it away. OK, is that on? Yeah. Thanks, everybody, for showing up. I hope you all have retired your Scottish kilts after a fun night last night. Um, I appreciate getting up early in the morning to come hear us talk. So today, Robin and I are going to be talking about a new initiative in the US, which has really been spearheaded by 52 university institutions. And uh, we're going to tell you a little bit about some of the goals and objectives of this initiative and some of the progress that's been made to date and also what the short-term plan is over this year in terms of achievements that we're targeting. What is unique about this initiative compared to many others that I've been involved in in any case is that this dis was not born out of grant funding. So there wasn't a big grant that was presented to come up with a strategy for digital preservation of scholarly materials. It was really driven by university librarians and CIOs that identified if we wanted to provide persistent access to, the, uh, to scholarship, and in particular digital scholarship, something really needed to be done today and at scale. That there were many efforts going around, going along individually, but they were very difficult in terms of scalability and cost effectiveness. And so that through collaboration, more could be achieved. And that this was really a, a big problem um, that should be addressed today. So I know many of you are familiar with the problem I'm talking about, and that is many of the materials, oops, it's advancing on its own. Many of the materials uh, that libraries are being tasked to steward today are not only born digital, but born digital and digitized materials. And coming up with systems to preserve these materials and systems which provide geographic diversity, make multiple copies, provide audit and health checking, as well as a number of other preservation services, migration, transformation, are not in place at scale and can be very costly and difficult uh, to do that. Many of us have repositories in place, but typically there are uh, an online backup or a single backup, and these don't deploy a complete preservation strategy. And with the rapid growth of born digital information, this is really becoming a much bigger problem. So about a year ago, a number of thought leaders from the university, CIOs and university librarians, as well as some technologists, came together to start to talk about how can we work collectively to begin to put a system, an organization in place, an approach that potentially could address this problem, at least within the national academic framework. And from that, the initiative DEEPEN was born, which is, stands for Digital Preservation Network. So when we talk about DeepIn, many times uh, we think about the actual physical architecture and framework. But DeepIn is really much more than that. It is an approach to preservation and persistent access to scholarship, an approach that requires replication of content across diverse geographies, diverse architectures, preventing a single point of failure. It is a federation of higher education that's coming together to collectively solve the problem based on their experience. 
And it is a community that has already put a number of systems and architectures in place and enabling those architectures to work in a diverse ecosystem at scale. So the conceptual framework uh, is diagrammed here. So at the very core of Deepin, there are a number of what we call replicating nodes. And these are diverse architectures which replicate the content in a minimum of three, but maybe even up to five um, architectures that are diverse, that are in diverse locations and are run by different administrations. And the role of these nodes is to have complete copies of content in each, so that there are full copies, full replications of uh, each of the other replicating nodes. So that if any single node fails, you've got backup and restore capabilities from the other nodes. And this is not just a metadata store, it is a real content object store. In the second layer, you have the contributing nodes, and the contributing nodes are really aggregated repositories that are pushing content into the replication node, which is performing the preservation services. Contributing to the aggregated repository are what we call um, our local repositories. So you can see an ecosystem where you have repositories set up at a number of institutions. They are then moving content into the aggregated repository, and then portions of that content are then funneling into the replicating node. And each of those uh, nodes are run at different organizations under different architectures in different geographic areas. Some of the core principles of Deepin that were agreed to by the 52 institutions that are taking part of this initiative is that this organization, this approach, really be owned by the academy. So we're not relying on commercial institutions to perform this, whether that be publishers or um, the like, that we are really going to own and manage this initiative. Diverse geographic regions, I've talked about that each of the replicating nodes will stand alone in a different region. The organizations that today have expressed interest and signed up to really <laughs> start this process in terms of establishing replicating nodes are University of Michigan, Stanford, Texas Digital Library, San Diego through their Chronopolis effort, and University of Virginia. So those are the five core institutions that are building what we call the replicating nodes. These organizations will deploy different architectures to ensure a diverse ecosystem within the Deepin network. These are some of the, the architectures. Um, Robin is going to talk specifically about their uh, aggregated repository and replicating node, which is going to be run uh, on a Fedora DuraCloud stack. University of Michigan has a Hathi Trust uh, stack. Stanford has their Stanford Digital Library configuration. And Chronopolis has um, an IRODS implementation. Ideally, this initiative has begun in the US, and that's for simplicity of being able to get something off the ground. But ideally, this model could extend beyond the US to have an international ecosystem. So that is really some of the long range thinking. So Deepin will perform these core uh, functions, preserve the scholarship for future generations, which is really the core principle for putting this type of ecosystem in place. Uh, provide funding for the replicating nodes to ensure that there's functional independence, audit and verify the content in each of these nodes, and provide a legal framework for holding the content as well as succession rights. And when we, what we mean by saying succession rights, if one of the contributing nodes goes away for political reasons, for funding reasons, then the content that has been stored in those replicating nodes would be able to be lit up. So that is what the succession right uh, enables. There is a very lightweight governance model that's in place right now for Deepin, and this will become more fully fleshed out over time. But these are the key um, folks <coughs> involved with some of the core working groups in uh, the Deepin uh, 
federation, I'll call it. Um, and they're driving different parts of the Deepin initiative. So you have a number of folks under the replicating node that are driving the technology. Uh, you have Winston Tab from John Hopkins, which is driving the data content and the data modeling. And then you have Anne Wilbert from MIT and Paul Kaufman that's driving the governance. So to date, as I've mentioned, there are 54 partners. These partners have contributed $1.5 million in funding, and this is to get the initiative off the ground. Again, that is not grants funding. That's funding coming directly from the institution. And what is <coughs> really unique about this particular initiative is that they have gone to university presidents to get their support and embrace this idea. So it's really a top-down approach in terms of solving the problem. It is not driven from grassroots folks that are working on the ground. And they've hired a full-time project director last week, uh, so therefore making uh, some progress on putting some full-time staff uh, involved. Okay, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Robin. Well, so can everyone hear me? We'll take questions right at the end. Can you hear? Yes. Did you say you want questions at the end? Yes. Yeah. If we could hold questions to the yeah. end, that would be great. OK. So um, Ac Academic Preservation Trust, a group of people from primarily the mid-Atlantic states, got together to talk about possibilities if we were to aggregate content. And many of the members that got together to talk about the initial um, problem with AP Trust were also part of the deepen um, discussion. And so not only were they talking about aggregation, but they were also talking about this preservation problem. So AP Trust is primarily a consortium committed to the creation and management of an aggregated repository but as the discussions with Deepin matured, they also began to talk about possibilities of being one of these Deepin replicating nodes. So why create this separate thing? It's about community building. Primarily the uh, partners that got together initially were Fedora-based institutions, but as they gained more uh, partners, it also uh, became not just about people that had Fedora repositories, but people, some that didn't have repositories, some that had DSpace, some that had Fedora, but the possibilities of what they could do if they came together as a community. They were also talking a lot about economies of scale, you know, things that we could do together that we couldn't achieve individually, possibilities in the future for what we could do with aggregated content, um, the long-term preservation problem, and also beefing up disaster recovery. I don't know how many of you have been or, uh, aware of some of the problems that we've had on e the East Coast in the last couple of years with storms, but in Virginia we felt really at risk uh, as these different storms came through and we didn't have actual preservation outside of our geographic area. <coughs> So the consortium is made up of basically four separate uh, pieces, components. There's the business and marketing strategy, obviously all of the outreach and uh, partnership building. There's also the governance and policy and uh, legal frameworks, so making sure that there is a stable organization, a sustainable financial model, and a good policy framework. There's obviously the um, technical side of it, so building these repositories, both the aggregation repository and also the replicating node for Deepin. And then all of the um, preservation and collection strategy uh, work. So all of this is part of the consortium effort. So really, we had to bring together the strengths of not only the university librarians who had to buy in to the problem space and also be part of the um, power to build the organization and create the financial models. But we also needed people with deep expertise in collection strategies 
and also uh, technical expertise to actually implement the technical infrastructure. So the primary AP Trust services are the aggregation, preservation uh, repository, the replicating node for Deepin, which is a separate uh, repository, and also access services, which in the initial stages of AP Trust implementation will be limited to administrative access, but we're building an architecture that is forward thinking that uh, more access services can be, be built on top of. For instance, uh, in the future, you could conceive of lighting up content so that your users could actually get access to content at this remote uh, aggregation node um, and the possibility for having aggregated content from multiple institutions. So you might say, well, how, there's been a lot of confusion around because AP Trust and Deepin were kind of forming at the same time and because AP Trust is now talking about participating in Deepin as a replicating node, people have been confused about the difference. And we usually talk about this in terms of winnowing of content. So you can imagine researchers have files in their institution storage systems at UVA, they actually uh, lease wedges on central computing disk infrastructure and they have a lot of their files there or maybe in a uh, repository that's specific to their school or maybe to their discipline. And then you have the institution repositories at the University of Virginia, we have Libra and we certainly have scholarly materials being deposited into Libra. AP Trust is really to increase our preservation strategy at each of the partner institutions. So to give us a separate geographic place to uh, add to our preservation strategy, and as Michelle mentioned earlier, not have simple backups or extra copies of tapes in our local data centers that could be easily taken out by a tornado or some other kind of event. And then Deepin is actually for um, long-term preservation. So we're looking at AP Trust as offering a service where people can put in content and take it back out in some cases, and they can also have content in there that's bound for Deepin. So uh, that'll become clear as I talk about the architecture. So this is a nice slide that talks about a little bit of the differences between AP Trust and Deepin. Uh, Deepin does not have an aggregation repository, is not format aware, will not offer end user access services, and uh, is not a replicating node in itself. It's the framework for that. Um, and likewise, AP Trust is not a, a framework. So the objectives of the initial phase, which is really um, in progress right now and will last through the end of 2013, is engaging partners, looking at building a stable organization, stable financial models, um, hiring a project director, building the aggregation uh, repository, and also standing up the deep and replicating uh, node. Currently, our AP Trust partners are Columbia, University of North Carolina, Duke, Notre Dame, the other institutions that you see here, but we have many other people that are interested. Um, the governance board is very lightweight right now, and I'll just point out that we have a couple of liaisons, a technical liaison and a content strategy liaison, the project manager for the implementation, and, um, and then other people looking at uh, the other pieces of governance. So the service implementation is a phased approach. It's being built on the experience that we have already deployed at our institutions, leveraging open source. We're partnering with DuraSpace and using DuraCloud, using CloudSync technologies from them, also looking at leveraging um, cloud storage systems and compute nodes. So we're really looking at using as many production pieces that are in place today and bringing those together. So um, really trying to leverage economies of scale. And I put track up there just because we're using that as a guideline for the architecture build. 
So I think I have two minutes, four minutes. So um, the things in the um, orange brown, you can consider at your local institution. So everyone has, or at least in our partnership, a legacy workflow. We don't want them to change anything about their legacy workflow except at the end. <laughs> so we're going to require that people put in a very minimal set of Dublin Core metadata together for AP Trust um, and also use an AP Trust utility to actually um, build the uh, necessary components for ingest into the AP Trust repository that lives in the cloud. And this just shows that we'll be moving, we'll be ingesting actually into DuraCloud services um, to, at the first initial stage, then syncing into a Fedora aggregation repository. And then for any of the content contributed by partner institutions that's bound for long-term preservation and deepen, it will move from that Fedora repository into, uh, again, DuraCloud service storage in the cloud for our Deepa node. And at whatever point the Deepa organization is ready to make a decision about whether we need um, repository services over top of that storage, then we could actually use what we've already built for uh, our aggregation node, use that same strategy for our Deepa replicating node. So, uh, this slide is about a single administrative interface. So we wanted for the administrators at each of our partner institutions to give a single administrative interface that gives them access to administrative capabilities across uh, the DuraCloud services, CloudSync, and Fedora. So we're building a single um, administrative interface to allow things like running audit reports, uh, functionality that people would normally take uh, in any of those individual administrative interfaces. And that's actually using the APIs from each of those services. So forward looking, uh, we will have actually a proof of our architecture in place by the end of 2012, so the end of fourth quarter, and then have reactions to that from the partners and then build out so we expect to have a full service implementation by the end of 2013. After that, we're looking at uh, disaster recovery access services. So what I mentioned before about the possibilities of being able to light up uh, your collection and have people authenticate through AP Trust aggregation for disaster recovery. Um, the initial implementation will allow people to put bits in and pull bits back out, but this is about access services. End user access, again, there's been some discussion among the partners about wanting to um, have access actually for some content at the uh, aggregation repository. That's a possibility. Format migration services is of great interest. That's considered a very difficult problem, but something that our partners are interested in. Best practices for content types and common formats. Um, coordinated collection development. We thought it would be really neat if we could pull content from two or three institutions into a single exhibit um, or those types of services across aggregated content. And then also looking at hosted repository services for institutions that actually have no repository themselves. So aptrust.org if you want more information, and that's all I have. Would you like to come up to the podium mic and then you can take questions? Ask her. Thank you for this um, quite interesting presentation. I'm uh, Asger, uh, Asger Blickinger from the State University Library. Um, in Denmark, we are building a national bit repository that sort of uh, mirrors many of the faults behind the DPN. Um, but uh, one thing that might just have been unclear from the slides uh, you used, it seems like every content in every uh, mm, partner organization is replicated to, to all the other partner organizations. In our um, 
in our system, we basically um, had that um, people people who wanted to have something stored could um, sign a contract with the different organizations for uh, uh, amount of storage and the kind of storage, like tape storage and so on. And then, um, so we sort of brought a, a element of economy into it. If someone w um, provided very expensive, inefficient storage, they would probably be overlooked, while those who provided cheap storage would be uh, favored. Um, but it seems like every everything for everybody in the DPN, DPN model. Is that correct? Yeah, so right now that is the principle. One of the things that we have talked about is that you might have centers of excellence that come out of the, uh, the DPN overall ecosystem. So you might have some that specialize in videos, some that specialize in books. Uh, and those would be primarily focused on access services, but in terms of preservation, you wanted to ensure that you have multiple copies of all of the content going through the, the system. And the, uh, the particular technologies deployed would be diverse. So you might have some organizations that choose to do tape backup with um, robotics to be able to pull that stuff online. You might have some organizations that all do it on disk. You might have some organizations do it in the cloud. But it really is a diverse ecosystem. And so um, that's where we're at today. So the, in terms of the costing, the funding would be, a, would be collectively across all of those organizations. But you can't really yeah. You can't choose and say, I want my stuff in replicating node A, but I don't want it in replicating node B, because that would break the ecosystem principle. At least in the model today. The, the political administrative makeup of DPN chooses the number of uh, replicas you want. Yes. Right. Uh, so uh, we have uh, time for about two more questions. So I saw one in the middle. Oh, we've got three or four. If you're quick and good, we can do all of them. But if you're not, we can't. <laughs> A very short question. Uh, actually, it looks very similar to locks what you're doing, and uh, I, I would like to know what the main difference uh, between private locks networks and, and, and DPN, and d did you also look at locks uh, at the first place? Yeah, so uh, Tom can chime in here because he's probably closer to locks than I. So locks is a technology for preservation that <coughs> is a single architecture, which does a great job at what it does. So locks will probably be deployed as one of the architectures um, within the ecosystem. And I'm guessing that Stanford is looking at deploying locks as, their, as part of their preservation replicating node. But it won't be the only architecture deployed. So AP Trust is looking at DuraCloud for its part of its preservation ecosystem. Hathi Trust has a completely different preservation architecture. And that's part of the point, is to put in different architectural <coughs> systems so that if, for example, locks was attacked, either through, uh, you know, it locks as faults. It wouldn't affect the whole ecosystem. You just have that one component go down. Um, hi, Michelle. Um, I'm uh, wondering, the, uh, I understood the, the approach for DPN is uh, replication. Um, but what about format obsolence? Um, will there be tools for uh, format, format uh, identification, validation, and migration? Yeah, so I, I think there's a, a question, will that, will those level of services, migration, emulation, transformation, <laughs> will they occur at the aggregated repository, which is a little bit what Robin is working on? So the aggregated repository sits on top of the replicating node. Um, and it is not fully defined. Those services, we know they're needed. The question is, which of, um, which of the organization in that structure, that, that stack I showed you, who will be responsible for those? Um, and it's, I don't think it's fully flushed out yet. My guess is it will go to the aggregated repositories because they'll have more policy, more management, and they'll have the end users or end user organizations making those decisions. Once it's within the deep end network, the replicating node, that is really uh, object storage just replicating and making sure that your, your content is safe. So it's really just an audit, um, you know, health checking functionality. All right. So with that, we are at time. Can we have one final round of applause for our two speakers? 
And uh, next up, we will have a, a panel uh, facilitating.